Uh, hello, this is Kenneth Holditch from uh, New Orleans, uh, the University of New Orleans for many, many years, but but I always has, uh, I was insist on adding a, a native Mississippian. Um, the Mississippi Delta, so flat and so wide that the four seasons could walk across it abreast. That's Tennessee Williams' description of the Delta. And I think it's one of the best descriptions of the Delta I've ever heard. Uh, it's the description of the place that had more influence on him than any other spot. He was born in Columbus, Mississippi. Uh, he wrote a few things that relate to Columbus. He went to the to as a child went with his parents to Clarksdale, Mississippi, and Clarksdale and the rest of the Delta continued to influence him for the rest of his life. And then he came to New Orleans and New Orleans certainly had an influence on him. But even in the New Orleans plays, uh, there's always that Delta influence. For example, in Street in Streetcar Named Desire, which is set in New Orleans, and is, I think, the quintessential work on New Orleans, or one of the quintessential works on New Orleans. But even so, Blanche Dubois keeps talking about Belle Reve and uh, the Delta from which she, she came. Um, he, uh, it's funny, uh, a lot of people think he talks about, she, had, she comes from, from um, Laurel, she says. And so I have, I had people who came to see me from foreign countries and around the United States who were here to study Tennessee Williams and they would go to the Delta and frequently meet with Penny Mayfield, of course, and then come here and meet with me. And then they'd say, and we're going to Laurel, Mississippi. And I say, for God's sake, why? <laughs> because there's, there's no real connection between Laurel and, and Tennessee Williams. I don't even know that he ever went there. He used it for one reason. He loved the name Laurel. It, it was, first of all, it, it had its association with the Laurel Wreath, which was the, the honorary title that the poets were given, the honorary uh, award the poets were given in ancient Greece. And so that's why he chose a Laurel. But, but when he talks about the Delta and when he talks about Blue Mountain, Mississippi, or Heavenly Hill, Mississippi. He's talking about Clarksdale. It's the Clarksdale of his youth, the early 20th century Clarksdale, uh, some of which is, is still there. I mean, it's still in evidence because Clarksdale has not really changed totally through, through the years. Uh, the Delta has had a great influence on a number of writers. Uh, on Eudora Welty and on Faulkner. Uh, certainly Faulkner talks about it, the early Delta, the Delta before it became, before it even had towns, which is the big woods that he describes. And uh, Eudora Welty writes beautifully about it in the in Delta Wedding, which is one of her, I think maybe her, her best novel. Uh, but Tennessee, uh, was simply unable to, to escape from that powerful influence, even had he wanted to. As a child, uh, I lived with my parents uh, in Matson, Mississippi, which is just a few miles south of Clarksdale. And we lived there for a year. And uh, that one year made such an influence on me that I've never forgotten it. I'm a a hill-born Mississippian from the north, from uh, the northeast. Uh, I was born six miles from where Faulkner was born and uh, 60 miles from where Tennessee was born. Uh, I, I wish I had, I was in that area. I should have caught some of that magic on my own, but alas, it didn't seem to work out for me. Uh, but I, I like to, uh, to think I at least can, can benefit uh, others who don't know about them and let them know how much the Delta influenced Faulkner and Tennessee and, and Miss Eudora.
But when I was a child in the Delta, I remember I was there early enough. Uh, I, I'm, I'm somewhat ancient now, so I can can talk about it without. Uh, I don't worry about people knowing how old I am. But I remember seeing uh, on uh, Confederate Memorial Day. I, I remember seeing Confederate old Confederate veterans marching down the street and the, the band playing the Bonnie Blue Flag and Dixie, of course. And heaven knows those days are, are long past, but uh, that would have been uh, certainly after Tennessee was there, some, I guess, two decades after Tennessee was there. Uh, but but I, I think it was much of the same influence that he went through. We, when I was a child, uh, we had to take quinine because to fight off the possibility of fever. And there's a great deal of talk in Tennessee's plays about fever. Uh, in in, uh, in Summer and Smoke, for example, they, they speak of the fever clinic, uh, which the doctor, the young doctor and his father are involved in the fever clinic at Lyon, Mississippi. Tennessee loved those particular those spots. Um, Eudora Welty has said, uh, commented a great deal about the influence of place. And I don't think we can over influence how much place uh, affects a writer. Some people are lucky being born in a particular place. And Tennessee was not born in the Delta, but he went there at such an early age that it made a deep, deep impression on him. And, and he never freed himself of it, nor indeed did he want to. Uh, there is a comment that he later made uh, in a letter to his grandfather in which he says, I need to come back to the Delta uh, to renew my association with it. So he was well aware of the power of that influence. And that influence is, is nowhere better displayed than in the play Summer and Smoke. Uh, it was a play that continued to fascinate him for the rest of his life. He wrote a second version of it uh, in later years uh, called Eccentricities of a Nightingale. Uh, I've always thought that uh, perhaps that title turned people off. It was never as successful as Summer and Smoke. It never got as much attention as Summer and Smoke. Although oddly enough, I remember I've spoken to two uh, theater directors during years who, uh, who uh, both of whom thought that Eccentricities of a Nightingale was a better play than Summer and Smoke. I think Eccentricities of a Nightingale has some elements of it that are very appealing and perhaps should be incorporated into Summer and Smoke. But Summer and Smoke seems to me the purest, uh, best evocation of what he wanted to say. Um, I think what he found in the Delta was um, that strong, exotic and even erotic influence uh, that he realized was a part of, of human life. And at the same time, that uh, evanescent romantic element of life that's embodied uh, in, in some of his, his characters, in many of his plays. Um, the doctor in in Summer and Smoke uh, exemplifies that uh, erotic element of life. Uh, he's, he's very much uh, in a part of, uh, of uh, the young, the young in one another's arms, if you will. Um, uh, and the two uh, that Keats writes about, whereas uh, Alma, uh, the protagonist, uh, Alma, whose name means soul, she hesitates to quit. She doesn't hesitate to tell him. Uh, she is all spirit. And they can't get together. They're like 
uh, faded souls passing in the night, if you would, uh, she decides later, uh, as the play goes on, the, the Delta obviously has a great influence on her, that she's been wrong being too spiritual. And so she decides to become physical. By this point, he's become more, more spiritual. And so they just never the twain shall meet. And it's very sad. So Alma winds up um, uh, seek, uh, finding uh, consolation, if you will, uh, in the arms of, of uh, traveling salesmen. It's almost like the traveling salesman joke turned into art as Tennessee was capable of doing. He was capable of taking what seemed sometimes the worst elements of life and making great art of them. But uh, like Tennessee was a romantic, uh, he, strangely enough, he was a romantic, uh, but at the same time dealing with the, the, the sometimes the, the grittiest part of human life. Uh, and, and we see that in play after play. Uh, he, he himself described in his essay on his, his, his poem, short story, which is sort of like an essay about his father uh, called The Man in the Overstuffed Chair. Uh, he describes how the father is so uh, earthy. The father plays poker all the time. The father uh, is involved, you know, has his women on the side and uh, is, is very as a drinker and is very earthy. And uh, the mother, on the other hand, is very religious. And so he says that he has those two elements in his nature. Now, I think most human beings have those two elements in their nature, but they're strongest, I suppose, in, in the the poet and the writer, and Tennessee was the poet. And as the poet, one of his, one of his favorite poems was John Keats's uh, uh, Ode to a Nightingale. And the Ode to a Nightingale is about the poet uh, talking to the nightingale and saying, farewell, farewell, for I will fly with thee. Uh, I would love to fly with thee. He wants to go away with the nightingale where things are always beautiful and uh, the nightingale doesn't, isn't, uh, no hungry generations tread thee down, Tennessee says. So it's, it's always the, uh, the fleshly versus the spiritual. And this happens in play after play of Tennessee's. We can see it in Streetcar. Uh, we can certainly see it in, uh, um, the in the, the other place, the, all the other place set in the Delta, uh, as well as 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 well almost everything Tennessee wrote. One of his greatest poems is that poem from Night of the Iguana, in which he says uh, he's speaking to uh, uh, the, the, uh, the what is spiritual as opposed to what is physical. And he says, uh, I would like to, to go away and, uh, uh, and be, be away from this uh, earthly, uh, whatever is earthly that drags him down. And that of course is quintessential romanticism. The irony is that when Tennessee first started writing, he was, he rebelled against the earthy, gritty poems that the, were being produced in the 1930s and 40s, Clifford Odets and Elmer Rice and such writers. Uh, but he takes the earthly elements, he still uses them but he exalts them into great art and he sees the spiritual elements as well. So the two are at work uh, uh, in, in, his, in him all the time. And never do we see this more poignantly 
than in summer and smoke. Alma, who simply seems to many people to be a silly woman, just as Blanche was, uh, and, and a silly Southern belle, if you will. Uh, she speaks in poetic terms. She talks about, oh, the, the gulf breezes have failed us this year, she says. And of course, the, the doctor makes fun of her behind her back, as many people do. Uh, and having grown up in the, in the South, I know that kind of woman. Uh, I remember that kind of, of, uh, of woman, uh, women in, in, the, in the Tupelo where I grew up, uh, who uh, often they were, they were music teachers uh, or, or taught art. Uh, and Miss Alma, of course, is, teaches music, and uh, she uh, carries on about the beauty of of art and and the beauty of the soul. And of course, uh, the doctor and and the other members of the Delta group who are more earthy uh, make fun of her behind her back. Uh, it's a very strange situation Tennessee sets up there. The, the Alma's father is a, an Episcopal minister. And of course, uh, Tennessee's grandfather was an Episcopal minister. And so Alma might be patterned on certain elements of Tennessee's mother, Miss Edwina, who was something of a flighty lady in, in real life, of course, and very much uh, very different from the earthy father, Cornelius. And, but it's that struggle, uh, which I think inspired Tennessee with a lot of writing. Um, Dostoevsky has said that suffering is the origin of consciousness. And uh, he says that at one point, I, I sometimes I thank God for a toothache, Dostoevsky says, because it makes me know I'm alive and it makes me know I'm human. Uh, I don't think many of us want to go that far. I don't think we want to toothache for any reason under the sun, even to produce great art. But um, we see what, what's involved there, this whole element about you know, painful pain, out of pain comes great art. But I don't think there lived ever a, an artist, uh, be he musician or painter or, or, or writer, author, uh, poet, uh, who could produce great poetry without some form of suffering and pain. Uh, and that's not hard to achieve because I think there are very few people who ever escaped that, that kind of pain. And Miss Alma uh, has her burdens and she wants to create. And of course, Tennessee was aware that there were great many people, great many romantics who never created. They simply maybe had the desire to create as Alma wants to be obviously a great musician and, and has these, these people in her circle uh, who are uh, poet tasters, as we call them. They're not really great poets, but they would like to be great poets. And uh, Faulkner once said that every novelist is a failed poet. And uh, most poets, or a lot of poets, started out writing, uh, novelists or playwrights started out writing poetry. And that was certainly the case of Tennessee. And uh, we see that. In, uh, in his writing that his salvation uh, from those gritty, earthy writers uh, was that, that he brought poetry to bear upon his writing. He was uh, at his memorial service in New Orleans, uh, Lyle Leverage, who is the great biographer of Tennessee, unfortunately never finished his biography. He's never uh, able to, but finished the first volume 
which goes up through street, up through uh, Glassman and on that Tennessee brought to bear upon that is his uh, his uh, love of, of poetry and and Lyle's biography only goes up through Glass Menagerie. Good. So, so what, now, let's let's just create. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give another clap, and you can just say Lyle's biography goes up there and continue on. We'll be great. We'll just uh, stitch that right together. Three, two, one. Uh, Lyle Leverage's biography goes up through the Glass Menagerie, and he was never able to finish. Uh, the work beyond there, but the first volume was was there, and he saw that as as a, as a breaking point in Tennessee's life because there Tennessee really sort of found his voice and found his direction. He had written some early plays in the style of of Elmer Rice and and the Clifford Odets and those those early political protesters and. Thank God, thank God he was freed from that and got into his poetic mode. But when we had the memorial service for him here, Lyle, uh, the two days before the service, had asked me if I would write the, the, uh, uh, the tribute to Tennessee Williams. Uh, at the, if you will, at the, it was to be delivered at the program was to be held at the St. Louis Cathedral. Tennessee was was never a Roman Catholic, of course. He's although he was he was uh, abs actually baptized into the Roman Catholic Church uh, under his brother Dakin's direction. But Tennessee said it didn't take. After all, he said we were much higher Episcopalians than the Roman Catholics ever could claim to be. But he used to love to go into the St. Louis Cathedral and just sit there in the quiet, sometimes in the afternoons. After he had finished his work of the morning, he loved to love the feel of the church and the, the mystical experiences he must have had uh, in relationship to, to churches, which he always loved and, and, and wrote about, talked about. But when we had that, memo that, in that memorial service, Lyle told me, I hope that you will, will make it a discussion of Tennessee as a poet, the poet as playwright, he says. And so that's what I did. I spoke on uh, that day in, in the epitaph, uh, Tennessee as, as the poet playwright. He, had, he was writing gritty plays about the sometimes the most violent part of life as in streetcar the the rape and all of those things but he was at the same time dealing in poetry his language is always just filled with poetry when i was teaching the tennessee uh williams seminars at the university of new orleans i always urged my students to read the plays carefully and I said, don't skip over the stage directions because Tennessee's stage directions, which a lot of poets don't even bother with writing anymore, but the stage directions are often the most poetic part of the play. For example, when he describes Miss Edwina in, uh, his, in, in, in the, uh, uh, the Glass Menagerie, The Mother, he says, she is not paranoid, but her life is paranoia, which is just pure poetry. And of course, when Blanche is being led away at the end of Streetcar and being taken to the asylum and whatever horrors that may entail, she says to the, to the physician who's come together, uh, whoever you are, I have always depended on the kindness of strangers. And of course, that line is being used all over the world by people uh, who've never read a Tennessee Williams play. Uh, I've heard people use it, and I said, oh, I, you know Tennessee Williams? No, they don't know Tennessee Williams. But that line has become a, a part of our culture, an indelible, indelible part of our, our culture. 
And we see that same kind of division in summer and smoke. Um, the, uh, the whole idea of how body and soul must exist simultaneously, must be held together and, uh, and, and we must not let one side take precedence over the other side. And that's what seems, seems to happen in play after play, Tennessee portrays that character seeking uh, for freedom from the, the horrors of the physical and seeking the freedom of the soul to get away from, uh, from that. And that's what Alma desires. Alma is so. And, and uh, the doctor, the young doctor uh, is very physical. He's having affairs with, with various women. He wants to take, Alma does indeed take her to Moon Lake for an assignation and it falls through because she's not ready for that. And then when he's gone and then comes back, she has become ready for that, but he has himself been spiritualized. So they, they don't get together. And that's the story, unfortunately, of life as Tennessee sees it. We, we miss the chances that might have led us to happiness, to joy. Um, in the um, very in the story of Alma and Dr. John, which is picked up in eccentricities of a nightingale, uh, we see that embodied almost perfectly. Uh, but we see it again in, in almost every play he wrote, uh, even in Night of the Iguana, which is not set in the Delta. It's one of the plays, one of the few plays in which Tennessee uh, really is not writing about the Delta influence, but the we have again in Night of the Iguana, uh, the characters, one of whom the, the, the minister uh, who's been expelled from his church and T. Lawrence Shannon, uh, the doctor, the, the physician, I mean, the minister, and then uh, the woman uh, who is the very physical in the play, and then the other who is very spiritual in the play. And so he can't choose the, uh, the spiritual one that she, she doesn't surrender and give up to him. She doesn't change as Miss Alma does. She continues on her way. Uh, but this is constant in Tennessee. And I think the Delta provided that to him. I think when he went there, uh, he, he had done much of, much of his work, much of his study was self-directed. He did go to college, of course, and we went to graduate school, but he was, uh, he was an autodialect. He taught himself, uh, he read everything. Uh, Gore Vidal, who could be rather hateful about people, once said, I never saw Tennessee reading a book. And uh, yet people, yet if you read his Tennessee's books uh, or Tennessee's plays, you realize how very many books he's read, that he knows um, uh, the, the classical literature, the Greek and the Roman literature, uh, his grandfather had directed him in that direction and that he knows uh, the Shakespearean canon certainly well and that he knows the Bible more than almost anything. Uh, the Bible and the Southern hymns were very important in the Delta and very important in his life. As a child, I was growing up as a child Certainly, I was, I'm very, I wanted to be a writer, a serious writer, and have wound up being a critic because I decided that Tennessee and 
Faulkner had written everything, had written out about all the things I wanted to write about and better than I could ever have hoped to have, have done it. So I turned to being a, a critic, but I've always been very thankful uh, for my education uh, in the church. Uh, not that I didn't go to school, but in the church, we were exposed constantly to the King James version of the Bible. It's the same language that Shakespeare was writing. And then to those wonderful Protestant hymns uh, that have that same quality uh, of, of beauty. Uh, and Tennessee was very much influenced by it. I wrote an essay a few years ago about the effect of hymns upon Tennessee and in his plays. Uh, it was in Clarksdale and in the Delta that Tennessee did had most of his exposure to the church because he was old enough by the time they got there to know what was going on. His grandfather was the rector of the Episcopal Church in Clarksdale and Tennessee and his mother and his sister lived with uh, the grandfather and the grandmother in the rectory there next door to the church. And the, uh, the, uh, the Episcopal Church, uh, the, the membership of that church was made up of, of I guess you would say, of the, the society of the Delta. Uh, they were the people who often had the most money. They were the, uh, the big cotton barons and their families, if you will. It's strange, Tennessee, uh, was aware of the fact that his grandfather's salary uh, and his grandfather's whatever money, extra money might come to the grandfather was very much controlled by the cotton crop. Uh, remember cotton was king in those days and Tennessee was perfectly aware of that 27 wagons full, full of cotton, of course, was one of his famous short plays, which then influenced the movie Baby Doll and turns up several times, but he, caught, he was very much aware of, of cotton. And I remember as a child smelling the, the, the cotton, cotton seed oil, which is that wonderful smell. It's almost like butter and, and, and popcorn and all those wonderful things of childhood, wonderful smells all blended together. And that you don't smell that anymore. I think they ship the, the cotton seed somewhere else to, be, else to be processed, but it was that cotton seed oil was a very powerful smell. And I think that all of that had an influence upon him, certainly uh, as a child. Uh, and he wrote his grandfather in later years, uh, how was the cotton crop? Uh, grandfather, I know, you, I know you're very concerned he says on one occasion, but what was the cotton crop like? When he came to write his, his uh, I think most powerful Delta play, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, uh, he was gathering information from a variety of people. A mutual friend of mine in Tennessee uh, had gone to Tulane and played football and Tennessee asked him uh, on several occasions to tell him what was it like being a football player. And he explained uh, the football of course, Tennessee uh, being more cerebral and poetic was not a football player and I would not have been interested in that uh, when he had the, when he was going to college and perhaps had upset the opportunity to, but uh, he, he was always gathering information and he, uh, went to a party at Columbus, Mississippi. When he went back to Columbus with his grandfather, his grandfather would often go back to the places where he had been uh, a minister uh, to see how the flock was doing and how the, his old friends they would do. And they went back to Columbus and stayed for, I don't know how long, several days of pictures of Tennessee there and the grandfather there and they were very, uh, always people were very happy to see uh, the Reverend Dakin, who was very powerful and, and, 
And he must have been a very interesting minister because he attracted so much information. And Tennessee went to a party in Columbus uh, at a, at, well, it was actually at Chippewa, which was not that far, but uh, it was a, a cotton plantation uh, where the party was held. And this lady whose, whose father-in-law owned the, the plantation told me that she was embarrassed because Tennessee kept asking these cotton planters, now how many acres do you have in cultivation? And she said she thought it was just, just sort of a tacky question to be asking uh, if you'd have to know the Delta uh, cotton aristocracy to, uh, to, to understand, I think, that kind of attitude on her part and, and their part. But Tennessee was gathering information for a cat on a hot tin roof when he has uh, a big daddy talk about his, his, his farm, his cotton plantation, how many acres he has on cultivation and so forth. Uh, but of course, that was not exactly in the Delta, but Tennessee had moved it all to the Delta because that was the part of Mississippi that he knew that was the part of Mississippi that had influenced his, his life uh, the most. Uh, I, it, it amazes me, I've always said that I think the state of Mississippi should have paid Tennessee because he was one of their best uh, advertisements. Uh, he continually talked about Mississippi and about being a Mississippian. He was very proud of, of the fact that he was a Mississippian. People, of course, could ask, well, why did you, why didn't you? Some of his, his friends would ask him when he kept talking about Mississippi, well, why didn't you choose the name Mississippi Williams? And he jokingly said, well, if I had, some of my friends would have called me Miss Williams instead of 10 Williams, as they did. Um, but he constantly talked about uh, uh, Mississippi. When I, I had seen him in New Orleans very often on the street and just we would nod to each other. But when I finally met him uh, and, and, and was asked to, to introduce him when he was giving his only public address, in New Orleans in 1978, uh, January of 78, uh, we, were, as we were going from the restaurant where we met uh, over to the Center for the uh, Performing Arts where the play was, where, we, where he was going to speak the next night and we were going over to check out he wanted to check out the lighting and the, and the sound system. And we started talking and I told him that I was from Mississippi and that we had mutual friends and that I knew people in Clarksdale and especially in Memphis, I knew a number of people who had been friends of his grandfather's. And uh, then we started, uh, we, we, the whole, all of, all of the conversation was, was about Mississippi and about Mississippians we had known. Uh, there's an old saying, of course, that if you put two Mississippians in a room with a hundred people and they don't know anybody else there and they don't know each other, give them 30 minutes and they'll find each other. Give them an hour and they'll discover they're related. And I think there's a great truth to that. Walker Percy once said, uh, Mississippi is nothing but a great big uh, family gathering. Uh, words to that effect, those were not his exact uh, words, but it, it is true that there's a great deal of warmth and affection. As much violence as is associated with Mississippi, there's still a great deal of warmth and affection that draws people together. And Tennessee certainly was aware of that. Faulkner was aware of that. 
and and uh, Eudora, Miss Eudora Welty, was certainly aware of that as well, and uh, that is particularly true, I think, of Delta people. Uh, I think that Delta people, as Richard Ford, the contemporary writer, said, uh, in the Delta, it's not really the the land, he says, that is so important. It's the people. That that's what makes the Delta what it is. Uh, William Faulkner uh, made only one comment about Tennessee Williams' work, as far as I know, and that was when somebody asked him, he had been to, he was in New York and had gone to see a performance of the, of the opening production of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. And he had read the reviews and somebody asked him what he thought. And he said, well, I don't think people really understand the play. He said, I think what the people who really matter in the play are the old folks, Big Daddy and Big Mama. They are the ones who make the play. And because he saw that, then you can see how Faulkner would have would have drawn that connection. He loved the, the Delta. And so they represented the Delta more for him than other people might have. Uh, and and with Tennessee certainly was aware of the, ca the characters of the Delta. Uh, we know for a, uh, for a fact that uh, Tennessee was most influenced perhaps in terms of Delta people by the Cutre Q family. And they were a remarkable uh, gathering of people that turned up in other writings as well, not just, just Tennessee's, but others. But he, he, all, all of his plays, all of his Delta plays, have, the, uh, in, have references to the Cutreers. Uh, and he, he was a child. He would go with his father, with his grandfather, rather, the, the Episcopal rector to visit in the homes of the grandfather's parishioners. The grandfather was a very sociable man. And apparently, if the truth be told, the grandfather was a great gossip. He loved to tell stories about what he heard from these visits and he met the, these Delta people. And so some of the stories that Tennessee told in his Delta writings, surely were influenced by the grandfather and they would, he, he reported going to Delta homes where he said the ceilings were so tall and everything was so bright. And of course, if you see the, the little house, the, uh, where the, the parsonage, uh, where they lived, uh, the, the grandparents and and Miss Edwina and the two children, his father was traveling around selling shoes, so traveling around the South. The, you can realize it was a very, it's a very cramped sort of house for that many people. And so you can imagine how these much bigger houses, the Cutre Mansion, for example, which is a classical house in, in Clarksdale, you can imagine the influence of those upon him. Um, I don't think Tennessee would have become the great writer that he did become had it not been for the Delta. The Delta uh, probably was the greatest influence upon his writing. Um, he had, had he stayed in, uh, grown up in Columbus, Mississippi, he would have found something to write about. Uh, it was in him to be a writer. And somebody asked him why he, why he told such, why he created such nasty Southerners, such unpleasant Southerners, and wrote about such violent things. And his response was, well, I'm sure if I had written about the North, I could just hear him speaking in that, that wonderful Delta dialect, which is, very much a part of him. I won't try to imitate it, 
though on occasion I have tried. But he said, I'm sure that if I had written, if I had grown up in the North, I would have found just as many unpleasant things and violent things to write about among those people, but they wouldn't have been nearly as interesting. And I think that probably is true. Uh, I've always been amazed being from the hills of North Mississippi and the hill people are decidedly different from the Delta people. Some of the Delta people tend to look down on the hill people. William Alexander Percy, for example, was extremely critical of the Hill people. And William Faulkner came to, to, uh, uh, to, to visit you know, William Alexander Percy on a few occasions. On one occasion, Faulkner was drunk and was supposed to play tennis with William Alexander Percy and apparently was too drunk to see the ball very well. And Percy was very critical of Faulkner for the way he behaved and attributed it to the fact that he was from the hills and was not a Delta person. But the Delta people, uh, that, that very powerful influence, which is infinitely intriguing, uh, you, you, can't, you just can't get away from it if you go there. I mean, I've known Delta people who thought when I was a student at Ole Miss, who thought nothing about driving 50 or 60 miles a night or one night to go to a cocktail party and then drive home. Well, in the hills, of course, we would never have done that. Now, of course, people would do it now, I suppose, but I'm talking about the 1940s and 50s. Life was so much slower than it is now. But in the Delta, there was that, and there was that uh, spin, willingness to spend all the money you had and uh, you spend it but somebody said because you're never sure you're going to get any more so you might as well go and spend it so the delta people were very those wealthy delta people were very extravagant now of course there was a the lower class of, of people in the delta who had a very hard life they were the ones who were picking the cotton of course uh, uh, the African Americans and sometimes the the Chinese and the Italians who come in and become a part of that culture. And Tennessee was aware of all of that. Um, I've always wanted at the Tennessee Williams Festival there, which of which I was one of the founders with Penny Mayfield, I'm happy to say. I was always uh, I've always wanted them to have parties at, at uh, Moon Lake at Uncle Henry's, which Moon Lake Casino, which is where Moon Lake Casino was. And they used to have it in the early events, but it's, it's a great experience to take people there because Tennessee, hardly any of his, there are hardly any of his, his uh, Delta plays that don't have some reference about Moon Lake. Uh, I, I can't think of a one where he doesn't mention Moon Lake. And uh, of course, in Baby Doll, he has that, uh, that wonderful house uh, that's where it's filmed. And I suppose a lot of people are assumed it was just built in Hollywood. And all sort of, but it was, it's actually there and now it's been, it's been restored. And, uh, and it's quite a, be a beautiful place. And people really need to see that. I think they need to realize the kind of life that these Delta people had. Uh, Tennessee recreates it. Uh, it's perhaps best seen and experienced through Tennessee, uh, but Tennessee is the Delta, the Delta writer. Uh, I'm glad he came to New Orleans. I'm glad that otherwise we wouldn't have Streetcar Named Desire and we wouldn't have suddenly last summer. And those are very much a part of this city. But uh, his great plays, other than, than Streetcar Named Desire, all of his great plays, all of his best writing, very strongly influenced by the Delta. Uh, whatever he heard, and remember he left there 
when, when he was very young. He did come back to visit his grandparents when he was a teenager and to stay with them for a good portion of the year once when his mother was ill uh, after the birth of, of Dakin, his brother. But he did come back to the Delta. But he, it was in those early years, but the point is those are the year, impressionable years. That's why I can remember we lived there only one year when I was uh, seven years old. And I can still see and feel and smell the influence. I can still remember the characters I met, uh, the boys and girls I went to school with in second grade, and, uh, and all of the things that happened in my life. Uh, and, and so those, and I was about the same age that Tennessee had been when he was there. So those are the years when he was soaked it up as uh, Thomas Wolfe's mother, who Thomas Wolfe who wrote uh, Look Homeward Angel, North Carolina. His mother said he was like a, he was a child among us taking notes. And Miss Edwina said of Tennessee Williams that he was, he was just like a sponge. He never, never missed anything. He, he, so he was, he was a, a, a little picture with big ears, she said, hearing everything. Uh, there's a wonderful story of Miss Eudora Wealthy when she was, would get in the car with her grand, with her parents and, and they would be riding somewhere and she would sit in the back seat and say, now start talking. And she listened to all they said. And that clearly must have been true of Tennessee Williams that he listened carefully to what they said. And it turned up later in his place. There are people in the Delta, people in Clarksdale, who for a number of years have claimed that Tennessee's plays were written by his grandfather. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's really hysterical, but you know, uh, apparently a number of people have been convinced of the fact that this is true. Uh, they said that only the grandfather would have known these stories, but the, doubt the grandfather was telling people, telling these children the stories. He was telling Rose and Tennessee these stories. And Tennessee took them and shaped them into great art. Um, I think if we wanted to thank uh, something or someone for the plays of Tennessee Williams, and it's, it's really a remarkable creation, what this man did. He, he rose from being a poor, not poor, but, you know, relatively, certainly not rich uh, family. Child, being a poor child in the Mississippi Delta to being the greatest American playwright who's ever lived. I used to say that and people would criticize me. Now I've noticed, noticed they've come over to my side of the fence. Tennessee is the greatest American there's no question about that. I don't think we can, I don't think we can ever dismiss that fact. And I think we uh, who are part of the, of Mississippi or Louisiana or the South in general can take great pride in the fact that, that he has become the greatest American playwright. Now, we don't want to say that you others from other parts of the country can't love him just as much as we do but he was ours first and now he can be yours. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Holditch. Uh, we have time for a few questions that people submitted ahead of, ahead of uh, time. And one of the things you said about Tennessee Williams as poet and playwright, and there's a great student question I'd like to pass on to you. The student writes, I just started reading Tennessee Williams' plays, and I noticed that sometimes after a few years, he goes back and takes another shot at it and names it a, a, a different title. Why do you think a writer might be doing this? And what was Tennessee Williams trying or learning or experimenting with that he felt that he wanted to try again uh, uh, with some of his plays? Well, I don't know. I think he was, I think he was just always, he was a perfectionist. And he wanted 
everything to be just right. I don't know. I mean, one would think Summer and Smoke is such a good play. Why would anybody go back and rewrite it? But he seems never to have been completely satisfied. Um, Gore Vidal described visiting with Tennessee once in Key West, and he got up one morning and he found Tennessee pounding away on his typewriter. Tennessee destroyed more typewriters than, than most people ever even saw in their lifetime because he was so hard on them and was, you know, would write for hours at a time. Uh, and and they'd wind up broken and he'd have to buy another. And so there were, at, at one time he had a cold closet full of them, I understand. But he would rewrite these these plays and uh, Gore Vidal asked him, what are you writing? And he said, I'm rewriting. And this was in the 1960s. He said, I'm rewriting Streetcar Named Desire. And Gore Vidal said, Tennessee Streetcar Named Desire is a perfect play. No, Tennessee said, I think that's it. So I think he was striving for perfection. I mean, I think that's the only answer we could, I could give as to why he kept going back. Um, I've heard a lot of writers, very good writers say, they never reread their works once they're finished. They don't go back and reread them. And that may be the reason because they may be afraid that they would find something there that they'd want to change, even at that late, at a later date. Wonderful, thank you, and great question. Uh, the other question from one of our uh, festival attendees is, you talked a little bit about Tennessee Williams's relationship to hymns, and, and they notice also that he also talks about blues or rock and roll. Uh, do you have any thoughts about Tennessee Williams and uh, the music that seems to uh, permeate through his plays? Uh, uh, the music of the church, the music of the juke joints. What are your thoughts about that? Tennessee Williams and music, Dr. Holdridge. Well, you know, I think as a poet, he was particularly aware of music. I mean, there's a relationship between music and literature, obviously, and as a poetry is a combination of of music and, and language after all. Um, in, I think in the, in the Delta, uh, it's hard to escape from and was in those days. It's, it's in New Orleans, it's impossible to escape from the music in New Orleans where I live now. And I think it was in those days in the Delta as well. There was, and even now, the blues, which originated in the Delta, still very strong, still can find that. Jazz, you can find that. I hope that the hymns, the Protestant hymns, are still being performed as much as they were when I was a child. I was growing up in the Baptist church. And so he, the hymns, I think that he loved it. The blues, it would be obvious, it seems to me, that he, the blues, in the blues, there are songs about people who are, are uh, pro, pro, have problems with love and with family. And those are the same stories in a sense he was writing. And, but he was very much intrigued by blues and he wrote those early poems called Blue Mountain Ballads, which were uh, set to music. By Paul Bowles and performed, and he he refers to music. Uh, street and streetcar, Blanche sings only a paper moon. Popular music that appealed to him it was almost always the popular music. It was almost always uh, that music that dealt with reality versus the ideal. You'll notice, but I, I just think I think it's not unusual for the great. Uh, playwrights or novelists uh, to be influenced by music. And Tennessee was lucky that he had the blues and uh, jazz and classical music too. His, his grandparents, his grandmother taught piano and uh, violin 
So he was exposed to classical music and he talks about that. Blanche, refer, you know, refers to, she refers to Mitch as her Rosen Cavalier. She says, Strauss is wonderful. Uh, the Rosen Cavalier, great opera. So I think that's sort of inevitable that he would have been exposed to that music. And had he been less sensitive, it would not have affected him, but he was sensitive. He was attuned to that sort of experience. Wonderful, thanks for the question and great answer, Dr. Coolidge. Uh, we have time for one more. Uh, and uh, the question is, is I've been reading these plays for a long time and I found the things that excited me and moved me when I was younger, uh, I still love, but I discover new things about the plays each time as I read them. What first captured your imagination uh, and your curiosity about ten Tennessee Williams? And how's your relationship changed to the plays uh, over the years? Well, what first caught my attention was that he was writing so much about people I knew, uh, even though I was from the hills and he was from the Delta, it's still Mississippians and uh, that unique brand of people um, who are, uh, who still roam the earth and are different from other people. And so, and the, but the stories he told were so wonderful as well. It was also, I must admit, uh, since I lived a rather sheltered childhood, there were um, startling and surprising and sexual themes in the plays that, that uh, caught my attention as a, as a boy. Uh, because those things were not going on around me, the same things that were going on in Tennessee's place. But as I got older, of course, I discovered the richer layers. There's, there's always, I've always said that, that people who grew up in Mississippi have a, a, a better understanding of a lot of Faulkner's stories, but that doesn't mean that they really know Faulkner better than people who live in Pennsylvania or some, some place way off, uh, or uh, some, even some other country. But it just means that we have an extra layer of understanding. And the same is true, I think, with Tennessee. So as I got older, that's when I, I, I found Tennessee's poetry and uh, that deep understanding of life. And of course, it, what he portrays in Summer and Smoke is two people who are outcast from society, not because they are evil or bad. Uh, Dr. John is, is a, something of an, a roué and, and uh, consequently is sort of looked down on by part of society. Uh, Alma is looked down on uh, society because she's flighty, uh, you know, uh, has a, this gathering of, of would-be writers who meet at her house once a week. And so these people are in a sense outcast. Tennessee was, uh, as I forget who it was who said it, Tennessee was the, the poet, the voice for the, for the outcast, for, and of course, because of his sexuality and, and because of his other, because of his political attitudes, he was an outsider, outside the, the mainstream. And so he became a voice for those people. And that's what's amazing, I think. That's what uh, draws us back to him. So this is something you don't discover when you're first reading him. When you're first reading him, you just maybe, or read, I say reading because often we don't get to see good productions of the plays unless we get to go to New York, as I used to do a lot. But uh, one of the wonderful things about Tennessee is he's like Shakespeare. If you can't see a production, you can always read him. 
and get a great benefit from just picking up the, uh, the, the, the poetry and the play and reading it. Read it as poetry, if nothing else. I often tell this story and get, uh, so you may have heard, if, if you've ever heard me give a lecture, you may have heard me say this, but, uh, but it, at the University of New Orleans, where I was teaching, one of the, 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 the drama teacher there uh, was a little upset because they, they gave me the Tennessee Williams Seminar to teach. But the reason they gave it to me was I kept hounding them and finally proved to them that it was worth a seminar. He was worth a seminar. And so I taught the seminar on Tennessee Williams for a number of years. And once she, well, she and I were friends, but she said to me, you know, I really don't like Tennessee Williams. And I said, well, then why do you want to teach it? And she said, well, I just thought because he was a dramatist, but I should have been the one to teach it, not you. But she said, you know, uh, the worst play that Arthur Miller ever wrote is better than anything that, the worst play that Eugene O'Neill ever wrote, I beg your pardon, I misspoke. Uh, the, the worst thing that, that Eugene O'Neill ever wrote uh, the, is much better than the best thing that Tennessee Williams ever wrote. And I said, oh, really? Quote a line from Eugene O'Neill. Because Eugene O'Neill, great playwright though he was, was not a poet. Tennessee was a poet. And most people who are literateurs believe, as I do strongly, that the highest form of literature is poetry. And that that's what people ascribe to. So I think that's where we move. We see this, we can read this, the stories of uh, Tennessee's plays and appreciate those. But it's when we come to, to, to see him as that poet of the, of the outcast that we have the greatest understanding. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Holditch. Well, you're kicking off the, the first Friday of the festival uh, and o over the course of today, people are going to be taking workshops on the poetry of place. They're going to be talking about music in Tennessee Williams. They're going to get to see summer and, uh, selections from Summer and Smoke and talk about how uh, this writing can talk about our current conversation in our current world. Any well wishes you'd like uh, to leave with the audience or our hopes of what they can appreciate, appreciate about the Mississippi Delta and Williams's work? Well, I envy you greatly uh, if, you're, if you are uh, seeing, experiencing the Delta. And, and in this case, I guess it is experiencing the Delta, uh, not in first hand, in, 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 not in person, but firsthand. But I envy you that um, for the surprises that lie in store for you. I wish I could be there. I, I have never missed a, a, a festival in the Tennessee Williams Festival in the Delta since Penny Mayfield and I ran into each other in a hotel in Nantes in France. We had gone there to to uh, uh, for a Tennessee Williams International Festival. And I don't know, that must have been 30 years ago. And uh, I told her, I, I said, we had corresponded, so we knew who each other were. And I said, uh, you know, you've got to do something about Tennessee Williams in Clarksdale, you must have a festival. So she brought me up the next year and we planned it and it's gone on from there. And the notion that I can't that I can't be there this year and can't visit that wonderful place uh, is painful for me. Uh, the Delta has such wonderful memories for me from the festival. Uh, the great uh, people, and Irma DeRico and her group, who used to come down and present plays, she come down from New York. Anthony Herrera, who was the star of that. Uh, serial radio uh, soap opera, As the World Turns. He's from Mississippi and he came many years and gave 
uh, and readings and, and uh, performances and uh, so many others who were there, uh, people who uh, performed uh, and Jeremy Lawrence who came in and summoned for Tennessee Williams for us. He said, anyway, I miss all, would miss all of us. Uh, sometime I hope we can all gather together in heaven perhaps and re reminisce about Tennessee and the Delta. So, I, but I do envy those of you who will be experiencing it for the first time, even though it may be at a distance. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Holdrich. You are uh, a beloved and important part of the festival, and we thank you for taking time out of your day to kick off uh, Friday's programming. Thank you. I loved doing it. I wouldn't have missed the opportunity. <laughs> Wonderful.